The U.S. Constitution is made up of seven articles or sections, and Article 4 plays a critical role in defining the relationship between the states and the federal government. It outlines the framework for cooperation among the states and ensures that the rights and responsibilities of each state are respected across state lines. For many people, Article 4 is the forgotten section of the U.S. Constitution, and it really shouldn't be. Most people know Article 1 pertains to the legislative branch and lawmaking process. Article 2 is about the executive branch and the role of the president. And Article 3 vaguely, almost mysteriously, discusses the judicial branch and Supreme Court. Article 4, on the other hand, is like the end of an episode of Unsolved Mystery. If you or anyone you know has information of the whereabouts of Article 4 of the U.S. Constitution or what it pertains to, Write to us at all. But it's not so mysterious when you think about what the framers of the Constitution were trying to set up. Let's go back in time. The year is 1787, and the U.S. has officially been a nation for just over a decade, and things aren't going so great. Actually, that's an understatement. Things are going very badly, and a lot of that has to do with the very weak central government set up by the first governing document of the nation, the Articles of Confederation. Look, this thing was a train wreck. Under the Articles of Confederation, we only had one branch of government, which was the legislative branch. That means no president and no Supreme Court. Let that sink in for a minute. Only a lawmaking body with no leader to enforce laws. That's like writing the rule, take one, on a bowl of Halloween candy and just leaving it on your doorstep with no one to enforce the rule. We all know how that turns out. Remember, the writing of the U.S. Constitution was the Hail Mary of a failing confederacy. The last attempt to save a sinking ship of a nation from crumbling under unpaid war debts, rising inflation, and the lack of a standing army. So, along comes this plan to beef up the central government, adding power to the legislative branch because that was the only branch of government under the Articles of Confederation and then adding two other branches, the executive and judicial, so that the central government had authority to make states do things, like pay their taxes, and respect the laws of other states. Remember, states were pretty unfriendly to one another before the Constitution. Under the Articles of Confederation, it was common for states to impose heavy taxes on other states' goods. They also had trouble converting one another's currency. I mean, how many Massachusetts dollars equals a New York dollar anyways? They could refuse to recognize legal documents from one another, and if disputes really got out of hand, could declare war on one another. So yeah, giving the central government more power to make the states behave was needed for this new struggling nation to actually survive. But there was a concern for what would happen to the states. Would they no longer have authority over anything? With this new constitution, would this be tyranny again from an impressively strong government? Well, Article 4 of the Constitution helps answer these questions and many more. It's broken down into four sections, so let's do a quick rundown. Section 1, known as the Full Faith and Credit Clause, mandates that each state must recognize the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. In other words, if you're legally married in one state, you're married everywhere. Section 2 deals with privileges and immunities. This section ensures that citizens of each state are entitled to the same privileges and immunities as citizens of other states. It means, for example, that a person moving from one state to another should be treated fairly and equally. A state couldn't make a law or enforce one that treats someone from another state in an unfair way. Article 4, Section 2 would make this law unconstitutional. Section 3 covers new states and territories. It outlines the process for admitting new states into the Union and governs the creation of new states from existing ones. 37 states have been admitted to the U.S. under Article 4. Vermont was the first in 1791, Hawaii the most recent in 1959. Now, most states were first organized by Congress as federal territories before they were admitted as states, but Article 4 doesn't require this. Take Texas, for example which was an independent republic before it was annexed by the U.S. and admitted as a state in 1845. Finally, Section 4 addresses the Guarantee Clause. It ensures that every state will have a republican form of government, 
and be protected against invasion and domestic violence. This clause underscores the federal government's role in maintaining order and democracy, making sure all states have the same or similar form of government, and that the central government will protect the states against invasion. The main purpose of Article 4 is about states and how they should behave, specifically with each other. But Article 4 also establishes the concept of federalism. And in this system of government, the central and state governments share powers and responsibilities. A key point is that they share powers, not that those powers are equal. This is a pretty common misconception about the federal system of government and one that you don't want to make. So, when Article 4 says that states are guaranteed to be protected from invasion, this is defining powers that are specific to the central government. But federal systems of government also give powers to the state governments, allowing them to manage more local responsibilities. Now, if I asked you, which government do you think has more total powers and responsibilities, which would you think it is? Well, I just told you that they're not equal, so throw that answer out. And it's not the federal government. State governments actually have more powers and responsibilities than the central government. And it makes sense when you think about it. So, the central government is greatly concerned with big picture stuff, like defending the nation, international affairs, coining money, and citizenship. These issues are so critical and so important that the central government feels no one else should be doing this. And rightly so. Things could go very badly if states could coin their own money or declare war on other countries. So for powers that are dedicated only for the central government, we call these enumerated powers. And enumerated essentially means that they're listed or written down somewhere, that being the Constitution of the United States. Because it is written there, it is for the central government and no one else. But aside from these major responsibilities, the central government is much less concerned with everything else, leaving the majority of the responsibilities for the state governments to take care of. That means everything else is handled by the states. Powers that are only for state governments are known as reserved powers. This list is the best example of reserved powers, but man, are there a lot of them. Think about it. If it's not written in the Constitution, and there's only four or five powers that are written in the Constitution for the central government only, then it's saved or reserved for the states to handle. And that's a lot of things. Now, reserved powers is more in reference to the 10th Amendment, or change to the Constitution. But we might as well talk about it right now. In the 10th Amendment, it mentions that if a power is not specifically given to the central government, and it's not specifically prohibited for the states to do, then this is a power that is saved or reserved for the states. So the 10th Amendment is basically defining this federal system of government without actually using the word federalism. You know, come to think of it, Article 4 of the Constitution also does not mention the word federalism. Okay, so here's another question for you. If Article 4 of the Constitution sets up the federal system, is the 10th Amendment redundant? The answer is yes and no. Remember, in order to ratify the Constitution of the United States, the anti-federalists, the ones who were not so happy about what they saw in the document of this powerful central government, wanted some assurances. They wanted some guarantees that there would be some changes made to reduce the power of the central government. So the Federalists promised to make a list of changes. We call them the Bill of Rights, right? The first 10 amendments or changes to the Constitution that would further limit the power of the government by giving the individuals more rights. The 10th Amendment simply pumps up the power of the states and guarantees that they will have their own authority concerning matters that are saved or reserved for states only. Okay, that's the end of the detour. Shall we continue? There's really only one other thing to mention about Article 4, and that's the fact that the central and state governments can also share a power. These shared powers are known as concurrent powers. The best example I can give of a concurrent power would be the power to tax. This is not a power that solely belongs to the central government or solely belong to the state government. Both of these governments need to do these things in order to fund their government responsibilities. So there you have it. Article 4 sets out to explain how states should behave with one another. It establishes a federal system by stating the central government will take care of the big picture stuff, leaving most everything else up to the state governments. 
and by doing so reinforces the concept of limited government, which is what we love here in America. Okay, I can see it in your eyes. You're wondering, how does establishing a federal system actually limit the power of the government? When we take all of the powers that a government can do and we divide it, we're actually reducing the power of both. If you can imagine taking all of the powers of the central government and the powers of the state governments and combining them, all of a sudden we have a very authoritative, very powerful government, and this is something that we don't want. A federal system inherently limits the power of the government simply by dividing the powers between the federal or central government and state governments. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks so much for sticking to the end of my video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. We'll make more videos soon.